always felt like so impressed with my opinions, even just being opinionated as a kid. Like adults who are struggling hate kids who are like observant. Yeah. Hate oh that my shit. God. <laughs> Ditto. They don't want to hear your intuitive knowing. They they shut you down and tell you you're wrong and tell you to stop lying and like on and on and on. And it's like, it's not my fault that you're in denial, basically. But, you know, that's just me. What was your experience like? Um, <laughs> um, I guess, I don't know. I It's interesting. I feel like <laughs> there's a part of me that, like, the Pisces part of me kind of disconnected a little bit. Like, I remember my childhood pretty thoroughly, but, like, it's like, it's glossed over kind of like, I know, I know the things that happened. I know the pinpoint, like I can pinpoint the things that happened, but like, when you ask me how I feel about some of it, I escape a lot of things. Like I, I can recite those episodes of Degrassi. I can recite an episode of Gilmore Girls. You know, Gilmore Girls had like, the longest scripts on television still the longest scripts on television I love that lady though what's her her and her husband's name I don't know oh Amy Sherman Palladino just amazing amazing anyway but yeah like I I escaped I I danced I sang even though my mom told me to stop singing (laughs) um I watched television I listened to music I I don't know. <laughs> uh, how did I feel about some of it? I guess I just, I felt like I was always doing something wrong. Hmm. And was that because they were telling you you were doing it wrong? No, it's not. People, they weren't, people don't. I don't know. I feel like people aren't explicit like that with children when it comes to like them trying to them trying to uh, like hide away from the the light that that children who who see things shine on it if that makes sense. I don't I don't think they told me that I was doing anything wrong, but I the way that people responded to me wasn't favorable. Uh-oh. Did I disappear? No. Yeah, you're good. You're back. There we go. Um, like, I just remember my ballet teacher being very, like, just, she just did not like me. Which is interesting because, like, now that we're, well, she was, she was always the adult. But now that I'm an adult as well, and I feel like things have gotten better. But, like, I just know that, like, even, even my fourth grade teacher, I mean, she was also real real racist but (laughs) but also like I could just tell that she just hated the fact that like I was vibrant and like that I asked questions that she didn't want to answer you know like that's really what it is like even the ballet teacher I just asked questions that she didn't want to answer I said things that she didn't like that other people didn't say which (laughs) kind of got me in trouble I realized um Actually, I didn't realize quick enough that in my friend group, a lot of them would be like, hey, Foley, can you say this? <laughs> can you ask this question? Because I'd ask because I don't like, you know, whatever. It's a question. <laughs> but I didn't think about there's a reason why other people were afraid. <laughs> That's so funny. They were they were using you. You were you were the puppet. Like, hey, hey, Foley, say this. Well. But the question, the answers, though, hmm, sometimes the answers are important, though. But you're right. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, totally. I like, I think there's something to be said about, like, being somewhat fearless around being willing to bring up taboo topics of conversation or to ask questions that, like, other people don't want to ask or whatever, like, Like, yeah, I mean, the whole thing roots back to probably maybe it was that they didn't want to answer or that they didn't know how. 
they didn't have a good answer. Like they're an adult having to say, I don't know to a room full of children. And most people's ego can't really like sustain having to admit, like, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, you know, like, and when we do ask deeper questions, like, especially when you're intuitive, I feel like you are asking people to meet you at a depth where you are, but if they're not there, then they're like, I don't even understand like, what are you even talking about? What do you even want to know? <laughs> like, there was a quote I found that was like, you know, people can only meet you as deeply as they've met themselves. And I would imagine between your Scorpio moon and your Pluto in Scorpio, that you're, you're working at a depth that like most people aren't. And so, yeah, you're, you're reminding them about things that they just don't normally even acknowledge exist. You know what's funny? I think isn't Pluto like Scorpio's ruled by Pluto, right? Or so, yeah, Pluto and Mars. Yeah. I don't know. I don't. I feel like I have to know more about Pluto. I uh, I have these astrology books, and I get like halfway through, or like a mid, quarter of the way through, and I start another one, and then I start another one, and so I have like seven books that I'm like, yeah. like an octopus just trying to. Like... Dude, that's how I use books. Front, front cover to back cover is overrated, I think. I don't, I don't know. That's just me. But yeah, Pluto, um, Pluto and Scorpio, like as a generation is basically intending to bring the taboo into the light. Like one of the most notable things that happened like during the Pluto and Scorpio transit was the AIDS epidemic that centered in the LGBTQ community and that like forced everybody to acknowledge that like this community exists and the AIDS epidemic was kind of like a spotlight that got shined on a lot of different things that were going on that like people just didn't want to acknowledge that that was real. And so Pluto, that was like during the transit itself, which was like 84 to 95 ish. And would that be right with your birth year? Oh yeah. 93. 93. Um, so yeah, that was like kind of the most notable piece that people remember from that time. Obviously there was more going on, but then the people who were born during that generation, that's like our soul's healing path is to like dredge up the taboo and like push it out into the light. And there's like a fearlessness that that takes to, you know, a fearlessness and to your point, a hard headedness that says like, I'm sorry, you're uncomfortable, but like, we're still going to talk about this. You're, you're still like on the other side of what I want to say. Like, like your Degrassi example of like, you know, taking on three, three other people that that hard headedness doesn't sound like a bad thing when you tell it in a story like that, because they're operating in a more hateful place of like, these people are wrong and like, you know, you shouldn't be able to look at that. And that's just an abomination and on and on. How dare they? And obviously that's not loving. That's not accepting. That's not unconditional love by a long shot. And your version is way closer, you know, if not all the way there. So like being hard headed as a loving individual seems like, like a pretty good plan in this world mm -hmm. to me, but Obviously, I haven't lived it. I understand. Like, it's probably a way heavier burden to carry. But I get it. Like, I got one of those of my own. You know, most of us do. When you really start tapping into your healing journey, your gifts, you paid dearly for them. But you did. You paid for them. Now they're yours. You have them. <laughs>